to talk while the uh, train is running, so I made the decision to uh, wait a couple seconds to start. We have, uh, there's not much going on downtown. There is a group that's just leaving. They were singing over there. I don't know who they are. Um, they're right next to Chase Bank. Uh, there is another group at the park. I don't know who they are either. It looks like they have a tour guy of, of some sort. We have some hissers um, back there somewhere. I heard somebody hissing. We are in front of the Pioneer uh, Courthouse and um, there's not a whole lot of activity going on in Portland except for this is the last of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Um, we're going to uh, try to do the work today. Um, I wanted to introduce you guys to this little basket here. This is a, uh, I gotta take off the price tag. This is the um, tithing basket that I purchased for 25 cents. So if you are a Christian and you see me downtown uh, preaching uh, the Bible here and you want, uh, I think this is probably gonna be uh, my new attire for the preaching. Uh, the church complains that uh, I'm not looking the part of a preacher or the pastor. Um, to me, it's just it's just extra extra baggage to, to have to carry around. But um, if you if God is putting it on your heart while I am preaching uh, to put pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, whatever you want in there, go ahead and do so. Um, other than that, there's not a whole lot um, else that I can do to force you to give to the Lord's ministry. And when I talk about the Lord's ministry, I'm talking about um, the preaching of His Word. Um, this is this is His. Uh, this is our uh, our last of the Ecclesiastes messages. So hopefully God will use you somehow, some way in the future to continue His work. So we're done today. If the American uh, people allow me to finish this uh, series. Sometimes they don't allow it. They have opposition to my face. I just had a guy wearing a pink shirt come up to me, um, ask me about something that was uh, dealing with his wife or they stole something from him. Uh, there's a telephone uh, right there. I suggested for him, there's the telephone right there. I, I suggested for him to use that phone and he didn't want to use the phone. I also suggested for him to um, go to the uh, Central Precinct, which is on 2nd and Main, and he says he's been there and they stole his phone or they did something to him, so I'm not exactly sure. I can't help him where I'm at. Um, I suggested the mission and he said no. So the only thing I could do is I can help him. Um, yeah, he was wearing that color pink. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which way he went. Uh, he wasn't a supporter. He wanted me to I'm not exactly sure what he was expecting from me. I, everybody knows here that I'm a homeless preacher and I don't have anything to give. I wish I could. I wish I had more authority, but I don't. I wish I had money, but you know, that's why I have this for the church. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray and then I'm going to go ahead and get started and uh, try to finish this as soon as possible uh, because the people get antsy when they see uh, me taking too long in preaching God's word. It's about 11.22 right now and so I'm going to go ahead and try to do this as painless and as quickly as possible. Uh, there's probably not too many people here to listen so I, I, don't, I don't really anticipate that. Um, they're gonna take in the message they never have you know it's been 12 messages and they're just you know whatever you know we don't care um, I'm hoping that God I want you to see one of their signs it says it, it says divest from dirty chase divest from dirty chase uh, that green sign oh I guess they are um, protesting against Chase Bank I wasn't sure what they were uh, protesting against uh, it's uh, I guess they're protesting against uh, Chase Bank. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, let me go ahead and get started, and um, let me go ahead and get started and uh, see what. I, I presume that's the LGBTQ community. They're against the preaching of the word, and. Um, and so they're going to start, I don't know if they're going to start going after me directly or they're going to hit. I don't know what they're going to do, but whatever they do. Um, if I have to start all over again and erase this video, I'll go ahead and do it. Um, I'll even move to somewhere else if I have to so that we can get the work done today. Uh, I don't have much uh, battery power, so um, we'll see how much we get done. If I have to go to the library, plug it in. 
whatever it takes to get it done today. All right? All right. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bless this hour, half hour, however long it takes to preach this message. Um, may you uh, withstand the darts of the enemy, Satan, who is here now. Um, who has filled the heart of the American people to hate and to oppose the preaching of the gospel. May you, O oh Lord, deliver those who need to be delivered from the evil of his ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, Portland. Greetings in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And uh, from the church at Seattle, the New Testament church, which are the titles that I've been using for the last two decades, hoping to reach those of you that are on the other side of the cross, those of you that are on the other side of the gospel, for our Lord. Because the Lord calls us all to kneel and to yield before Him. But we live in a generation where that doesn't happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Especially if we're so busy trying to keep up with the American way of life. Now, I don't have too much of an announcement or update to give to you. Um, you know that today is our, last, is our last message on Ecclesiastes. That is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We have been doing a series here, and this is the series, Ecclesiastes, King Solomon's second book of wisdom. Can Solomon's wisdom and counsel help Americans in the 21st century church in its spiritual growth? Most people would say no, Solomon's counsel cannot help us today. Solomon's wisdom cannot help us today. Therefore, we're gonna take another position. Um, as you know, I'm still looking for housing and, uh, and work, uh, waiting for some applications to be, uh, to be responded to by employers. They have not responded yet. Um, earlier this morning, I was uh, made aware that there's a homeless, there's a homeless uh, issue in, in Portland. I think if employers will open the door for people to work, and apartment complexes open the door for people to live, we may be able to uh, terminate this homeless situation if we work together as, uh, as a family to help one another. People don't have to sleep on cardboards in doorways if you're opening apartment complexes for them to come in and live. If you're giving them jobs, it's difficult to get a job um, and keep a job if you are going out of the grid of the requirements for work and turning it into some sort of morbid sexual thing. It's difficult to get an apartment uh, if you are going to um, go outside of the lease agreement and the application and um, call the tenants to some sort of morbid sexual position that does not coincide with the leasing agreement, you're gonna lose your tenants and they're gonna end up in the homeless community. So you have to be, um, I guess, uh, acceptable to the fact that everybody is different and some of us have uh, not necessarily different agendas, but we have different standards of living um, and we don't wanna violate that. So for the homeless uh, issue, I think you can nip it in the bud if we work together and help the people get jobs and keep their homes and not necessarily a victim as soon as something happens in the apartment. Um, last year I had made mention of, of the bathrooms, public restrooms. Um, at the park I had asked and suggested perhaps and even passed out flyers that doors be added to the men's restroom at the um, on 3rd Avenue there, 3rd and 4th in front of the courthouse in that government square. Nothing was done, um, but I did notice that women are making it their frequent visitation. They come in with their carts, 
they sit in the bathroom as if it is the all users bathroom here at the Pioneer Square Park. And I think that's a little bit inappropriate, you know, to be using the toilet and there is no door, right, on the, on the toilet, uh, the, the, the stall there. And as you're using the urinal and, and the bathroom, there's a woman sitting there hiding behind a cart, watching, listening, and taking in the few of all that we males do in bathrooms. I think that's a little bit inappropriate. When I brought it up to the police department, the police department said it's their right, they're allowed to use the bathroom, um, even though it is not designated as an all users bathroom, but it seems like the women are there. And you know what, I don't pass it if there's sexual immorality going on between the men and the women in the restroom. And I mean, that's why if they're adults, they can do whatever it is that they want to do. But for some of us, it may be a little bit inappropriate. You know, it's like going to PSU and trying to use the restroom, you know, and there's a woman there, you know, in the in the, in the the men's room, you know, or even a guy coming out on you and you're thinking, gee, you know, I didn't come into the bathroom for that. What is that? You know, it's that kind of inappropriateness. <laughs> you know, I've made mention several times of the rape issue. You know, uh, dealing with my own uh, people that are being used by the LGBT, people that are being used by the government or, or, or Grace Church or MacArthur or those people, the Klan, you know, because they're opposing what I'm doing here. They're opposing the gospel. They don't want Haitians, you know, uh, equal in, in, in the preaching. Or they don't want us to lead the, 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 the church. They don't want us to have a church of our own. And so you do, you know, you we're dealing with a situation that's very sensitive. You know, uh, it's embarrassing to um, to be cut down to the homeless position, having to sleep in the front of a door on a cardboard box, and then having a woman molest you, you know, while there's a camera on you on the front door, or going to the Portland Rescue Mission and her doing it in the chapel, or going into an apartment complex and her doing it in your own apartment which you think is secure, even worse when you're sleeping on the property of the police department right there at the central precinct and the police says absolutely nothing about the fact that, you know, somebody's taking advantage of you. You know, last week, five times during the course of the day, I was drugged um, so that I, I couldn't keep my eyes open. I'm not sure how the drugs got into my body, you know, whether it was given to me by a shot or whether it was given to me orally uh, in a drink that I purchased somewhere. But I couldn't keep my eyes open, but I was assaulted five times that day. And in the nighttime, even two more times. And so, you know, I'm dealing with a Haitian woman who's under the gun and who is being used to literally, you know, do one of these ordeals, you know, all the time. And it's like, man, you know, a person can only take so much insult and humiliation. You know, how much do you insult the Church of God? How much do you insult Haitians, internationals, right? To submit. The issue is you need to submit. You need to submit. How many times are you going to nip that issue of submission in the bud? What if it's not God's will for me to submit to that Haitian woman? What if it's not God's will for me to join that LGBT community? What if it's not God's joy, uh, a job or, or, or will for me to, to, to go in the in that direction, but to go in this direction right here, which is what he's been calling everyone to, right? Uh, we have a gay agenda, we have a government agenda, we have a Klan agenda, we have the African Americans with their own civil rights agenda, we have agendas of the yin yang, but believe it or not, God also has an agenda for each one of us. He didn't create us just for the sake of creating us and putting us in the world. You know, God didn't just make us in his image and then just let us go in our own direction. God has spoken, and in his speaking to us, he has had some uh, specific things that he wants us to know. And that is the reason why I have taken the time um, in this generation to preach to you this gospel. It's not for my own personal usage, but it's because God has called us uh, to this very purpose, to go make disciples of nations, to baptize them and to teach them, to observe all that he has commanded in his scriptures, and as the word says, lo, I am with you always. I look like I'm by myself, but I'm not. The Lord is with me. You may not hear him, you may not feel him, but he is with me. So I went in this, in this direction of Ecclesiastes, preaching 
um, uh, King Solomon's second uh, book of wisdom because I wanted uh, you to be saved, right? That was my tactic in trying to plant a, uh, that was my tactic in trying to plant a church in the 21st century. Uh, th this is what the word of God teaches us, right? I have a question here real quickly. Is church planning in the 21st century valid without the continued uh, coming of um, uh, of the Pentecostal Holy Spirit, right? No gimmicks, no tricks, no sex lies, or videotapes, right? If I'm going to plan a church for God, shouldn't it be the same process that the apostles had gone through, which was to preach the scriptures? And when they preached uh, back then in the first century, they also used the Old Testament to preach the scriptures, right? They went into the Psalms to preach the scriptures. They went into Ecclesiastes to preach the scriptures. And so that's that's what I'm doing in this generation is I'm going to the I went into the Old Testament to preach Christ to you so that salvation could happen a church could be planted and a group of us right a group of people could come and say hey I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and I am part of his New Testament church but no one has done that in the last 20 years nobody wants to identify with the Old Testament uh, nobody wants to identify with the New Testament Christ nobody wants to identify with the teaching of the gospel of Jesus right there is there is something in the American people that says it's embarrassing it's humiliating to identify with the Christ so for the last so for the last several weeks you know beginning in January God had put it in my heart to preach Ecclesiastes and I and I gave the city time right to 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 make the decision I gave the people time to make decision as I myself walked and stumbled and fell flat on my face and God knows if somebody was taking uh, inventory of how many times I, I fell on my face you would see nothing but what you would see sin and, and, and things that would make you cringe but let me ask you a question what pastor in this generation or even in this city has not sinned in the last several months what congressmen have not sinned in the last several months what uh, leaders right that have not sinned in the last several months we've been dealing with our president and even he was caught with his hands in the cookie jar so you know I mean you can't say that all hypocrites and that because of their hypocrisy, we're not joining the church. You see, God wants you to understand something. Salvation is for the sinner, not for the uh, super spiritual. Salvation is for those who are lost and in need of forgiveness. Salvation is for men like myself who stumble and fall on a day-to-day -day basis, who need the forgiveness of God, who need the pardon of God, who need for God to say, I love you, and I, 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 I forgive you for that evil that you did. That is the gospel of Jesus. It's the love of God in Christ Jesus. For, so for several weeks and several months, we went through Ecclesiastes. Uh, 11 chapters of Ecclesiastes. I don't know who heard the messages. You know. The Lord sends us out to, to preach the gospel. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear the message of the gospel that he sent, that he had sent through the uh, prophets, that he sent through the apostles, and now he is sending it through all who are preaching it, whether on television, whether uh, in the street corner, whether they're passing out flyers, the gospel is being made known for your salvation so that he doesn't have to judge you into hell. He sends the gospel for your forgiveness so that you don't have to stand condemned before him when, when you stand before his judgment seat. He sends the gospel so that you could be restored and reconciled to his father so that you don't have to what? Endure the penalty of hell and judgment. So we started in January, January uh, 14. We preached on the uselessness of all pursuits. Right? The whole purpose of, of teaching uh, Solomon's words of wisdom, it was to help you make a decision to realize the vanity of life so that you could turn to Jesus. You know that song, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our griefs um, and, and pain to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Right? In uh, January 21st, we preached Ecclesiastes chapter 2, pleasure works, purchases wisdom is vanity. All of it. It's all pleasure is vanity, the works that we do is vanity, 
All of us, buying slaves, buying property is vanity. Wisdom in itself is all vanity, futility, chasing after the wind. In February, we taught on uh, February 4th, we taught on there's a time for every event on earth. So when you look at your life, you would think that it's just happening. No, God has predetermined and preordained all of the events of your life, the day of your birth, and the day of your salvation, the day of your marriage, the day that you give birth to a child, and the day you die, and the day you stand before him in eternity. On February 17th, we taught on the acts of oppression, um, chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes. And you all know what oppression is. On uh, February 27th, we taught on the workings, dealings with God for his rewards in life. Warnings that Solomon had given to his generation and dealings with God for his rewards in life. What are the rewards that God has given you in this 21st century for you to live your life? Maybe a job, maybe a good looking wife, maybe a home, a car, uh, uh, stereos, televisions, computers. Those are all the rewards that you have gotten from God in life. Maybe able to, the ability to travel to other countries right maybe the ability to travel to other countries these are the rewards that god has given you during the course of your life um in march 8th we taught on ecclesiastes 6 verses 1 through 12 the futility and vanity of life um march 15th we came back and we taught on the comparison of joy and grief an observation of righteousness wickedness and wisdom ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 1 through 29 and on that day, I was opposed over there because of a sermon that I had preached that weekend before. And the sermon was on repentance for families not to abuse the children. And that was probably the reason why um, there was gun activity in a lot of the high schools. High schoolers dealing with sexual immorality at home go to school and they take it out on each other. Um, and I was trying to encourage the American people that the issue is not the gun, that the issue is their God. And that in that video was um, was sabotaged, but was sabotaged, but also rejected, but also but also was rejected, but also was rejected by YouTube. And so I couldn't upload, but I couldn't upload, but I couldn't upload the video. In the name of Jesus. I ask Satan to move on with whatever evil, demonic thing that he is doing. It is under Constitution that we have the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, and the freedom of religion. And so the scripture, and then the, and so the scripture that we continue to to, to teach in uh, March of 24th, we taught on Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. Obey the authority of rulers, the fear and works of God. This is what the devil will do against you everywhere, in every country, in every city. He will entice you with sexual immorality. He will bring the wicked to where you're at to judge and to hit. Even though the government may give us permission to preach and exercise our freedom of religion, Satan will put his man out there to make sure that you don't hear that gospel and that you don't receive forgiveness. And then we wonder why hell was created for the devil and his angels. In April of 26, preached on Solomon's observation and life advice, Ecclesiastes 9, verses 1 through 18. And in May of uh, May 3rd, we taught on uh, Ecclesiastes 10, verses 1 through 20, the fool, the exalted, and the wise. And then finally, again, we, we completed another video of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, the activity of God and judgment of God, which brings us to today's final message. Now, all the messages was not done here at Pioneer Square Park, because if that was the response of one American, what is the response of the other Americans who practice Satanism? What, what, what is the response of the Americans who practice openly homosexuality, right? You go somewhere and you're not even expecting it and there they hit you with that. And you got to respond as a mature adult and so you give them what they want. That may not have been your purpose for being in the place at the time, but hey, they want it, you give it to them and you're a forgiven Christian, you know, whatever goes, whatever float your boat, that's what you wanted. That's not what I wanted, but that's what you wanted, so I gave it to you, you know. But the scripture says for us to continue and to finish the work of this ministry so as a way of reintroducing this Ecclesiastes book 
Understand that Solomon, like the other authors of the New Testament scripture, have written out his thoughts, right? He wrote out his thoughts. But also, he was writing God's word. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, training, correction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate for every good work. In the New Testament, Paul says, all scriptures inspired by God. Peter says, no prophecy was ever made by one by, by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit f spoke from God. That was in uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21. So all that Solomon wrote was not only for our instruction, right? According to Paul in Romans uh, 15, 4, but also God's word to all generations. So that means your children and their children and their children will also hear this gospel until Christ returns. In other words, God is firm on his gospel being preached. God is firm on the fact that salvation must take place. It's not a question of whether or not you want to be saved, or we don't want it, or we don't want it. God says you must be saved, or else I'm going to burn your soul in hell. It's not a question of whether we like it or don't like it. It is mandatory and demanding of God that you submit to his salvation. But if you don't, and you're big enough and strong enough to stand before the mighty God that has created all these trees and all of these human beings that you see here in his image, who we're not expecting to be alive in this generation, if you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the living God, be my guest. So like Moses, who wrote the Pentateuch, um, who preceded Solomon and, and David, his father, who wrote the Psalms, Solomon now writes these words of observation concerning his time, right? In the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he now writes, right, the things concerning his time, uh, God's creation. He writes about wisdom and pleasure. He writes about folly and futility. He writes about the vanity of life, man's toils and labors on earth. He talks about oppression, slavery, wealth, and riches. If we, in this generation, were to explore the books of Genesis through Psalms, if we, in this generation, would explore the books of Genesis from Genesis through Psalms, we would find many examples of these subjects in these scriptures. Also, in the books of Songs of Solomon, two revelations. These would be a continuation of these subjects mentioned and exemplified by the prophets of Israel in their writings and the New Testament apostles in their epistles. Therefore, today, let's go back Let's return to this final chapter to observe Solomon's counsel and wisdom for our generation to help us or to help unbelievers choose Christ instead instead of hurting and clinging to the vanities of this world. Vanity of vanities, says Solomon. Vanity of vanities. The billions, the trillions, the billions of dollars that we use to, to build empires, empire states and twin towers and the billions that we use to, to multiply our ammunition and artillery to go fight countries that are not even interested in fighting us. Vanity of vanity, Solomon says, futility, what a waste of time, effort, energy, and money. So our 12th lesson, our 12th sermon, if I was to entitle Ecclesiastes chapter 12, I would entitle it, Remember God and His Judgment. Remember God, our Creator, but also remember His Judgment. We love to remember God as creator because of all his blessings every perfect gift comes from above coming down from the father of lights families children food good times and sometimes bad times but we love to acknowledge god in that light 
But as far as judgment is concerned, we always say, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, he wouldn't be a just God if he didn't have a response for all the evil that we do. What do you do with somebody who destroys an Empire State Building or, or, or Twin Towers and kills 5,000 people? What do you do with a man who leads 900 people to their death by poisoning them um, in, in the communion cup? What, what do you do with an entire generation who enslaves an entire a tribe? And, and, and that same generation comes in and takes over an entire country, wiping out. God has to have a just response. God has to have a holy response. He says, I am holy, right? Be holy for I am holy. He says that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in his spirit and truth. You have to understand, God is not just sitting there watching us and eating popcorn. You know, it's not like us sitting at home, flipping the television and flipping channels and just watching whatever we want. He's a holy God. He requires holiness from his creation. He requires things that we suppress and we don't want to deal with. That's why Romans 1, Paul says that even though we knew God, we did not honor him as God, but we became futile in our speculations and our foolish heart was darkened and we suppressed the truth of God for unrighteousness. And so God says, well, I can't, I can't live like this with these people on the earth doing all these things. I'm going to have to judge. I'm going to have to judge my own image. Though I love them, yet I'm going to have to judge them. You have children at home. You discipline them. You have criminals, your loved ones who are in jail. Even though you love them, yet you hire uh, judges to rule over cases. They're doing it right now in King County up in Seattle, in Multnomah County, right here, right? There is judgment going on right over there. Police officers are arresting criminals. I mean, what do you do with students killing students? What, give them a pat on the butt and say, go on, keep playing? No, you have to judge. You have to hit. You have to discipline because of all of the people that are hurting from these acts of evil. So we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And Ecclesiastes chapter 12 reads as follows. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. Verse three. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few and those who look through windows grow dim. And the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. And one will arise at the sound of the bird and all of the daughters of song, daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the tamperberry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the streets. Solomon says to his generation, verse six, remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then, verse 7, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Verse 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. Verse 11, the words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Verse 13, last two verses of the book. The conclusion 
when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person for God will bring every act to judgment everything which is hidden whether it is good or evil must it be the reading of the Word of God so what does Solomon say remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil day come remember your Creator before the years draw near and in those days you will conclude and say you are miserable remember your Creator before the Sun is darkened remember your Creator before the light is darkened remember your Creator before the moon is darkened remember your Creator before the stars are darkened. Remember your creator before the clouds return after the rain. Remember your creator before the days that the watchmen of the house tremble. Remember your creator before mighty men stew. Remember your creator before the blinding ones stand idle. Remember your creator before those who look through windows are dim. Remember your Creator before the doors on the streets are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. Remember your Creator before one arises at the sound of the bird. Solomon says, remember your Creator before the daughters of song sing softly. He says, furthermore, on top of it all, men are afraid of a high place. Men are afraid of terrors on the road. And the observation with their fear is the blossoming of the almond tree. The grasshopper drags himself along and the capper berry is ineffective. Solomon says, man dies to entering eternity and those left behind remain to mourn. He says, remember God, your creator, before the silver cord is broken. Remember God before the golden bowl is crushed. Remember God before the pitcher by the well is shattered. Remember God before the wheel at the cistern is crushed. And then afterwards, the dust will return to earth and the spirit will return to God. Vanity, futility, says Solomon. Those were the first eight verses of the scripture. If you were to summarize verses one through eight of Ecclesiastes 12, I think basically Solomon is saying, remember God before you age and die. If you were to summarize it, all Solomon is saying is remember God before you get old and you die, right? Verse 1, right? While growing up, do not forget that God is spirit. Do not think that God is unimportant and that he cannot be known because you are too young. Don't think that because, because you're a young man or a young woman that you cannot know God, right? When you read the book of Samuel, Samuel 1 20 and verses 27 through 28, and even Samuel chapter 2 verses 11 through 12, let's go there real quickly. Samuel 1 20. In Samuel chapter 1 verse 20, in Samuel chapter 1 verse 20, is the story of Samuel on how he was born and how his mother Hannah had gone up to the temple to pray and Hannah was a barren woman how many barren women do we have in our society today who have to adopt children because they can't give birth to children naturally we have a lot of barrenness in our society as it was in the time of Samuel so it says here in verse 20 it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel saying because I have asked him of the Lord and in verse 27 the scripture says for this boy I prayed and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him 
So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. You read in verse 11 of chapter two, the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. So your age means absolutely nothing to God. You can minister to God and have a relationship with God even at a young age, like Samuel, who became a prophet of God after Eli had passed away. So remember God before you age and die. Before evil days or evil time comes, or times of trouble come. Remember your, your creator in the days of your youth. Verse two, remember before the heavens, remember God before the heavens encounter God's judgment. Revelations chapter eight, verse 12 talks about it. Remember God before the strong become weak. Before the strong become weak. When you look at verse three, in the day of, that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few and those who look through windows grow dim. So remember God before the strong become weak, the seeing become blind, the worker stops working, the body endures its living limitation in strength, labor, and might. So before you get too old to understand the scriptures, before you weaken up while you're strong and while you stand strongly, now is the time of your salvation. Now is the time to know your creator and why he's put you on this planet, why he's given you the life that he's given you. Don't wait till you grow old. Oh, I'll do it when I'm older. No, do it now before you age. That's what Solomon is encouraging his, uh, his generation. That's what he was preaching to his generation. Remember God. Remember God before your homes are secured. Right? Finally. And new days begin. and peace established, giving security to man. Looking at verse four, he says, and the doors on the streets are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. If the doors on the streets are shut, it's talking about security, right? It's talking about security. And one, and one will arise at the sound of the bird and all the daughters of songs will sing softly before new days begin and peace established, giving security to man. Verse five, he says, furthermore, men are afraid of high places, of a high place and of terrors on the road. In addition, he says, there is fear on all levels. There is fear on all levels. So whether you go up to the top floor of your buildings or you stand in the street corners, there is fear on all levels, right? He says there is terror on the road and there is fear on high places. God continues, when you read the verse, he says in verse six, he says in verse five, the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the blackberry is ineffective. For a man goes to his eternal home, while mourners go about in the streets. So in addition, there is fear on all levels. But God continues to give fruits in its season, in its proper time. The grasshopper who hops, right? all of a sudden is no longer hopping. But what is he doing? He's dragging himself along. Something is wrong if that is happening to the grasshopper, the plant-eating insect animal. He says, and the, and the Canterbury, Capperberry is ineffective. Verse five. We see that the grasshopper is doing opposite of his nature. 
into Camperberry, which is which gives a sauce, is used for sauce, for condiment, is tasteless. So it seems like he's talking about opposites here. Instead of the grasshopper hopping, it's dragging itself along. Instead of the Camperberry, um, the seed that makes the sauce for condiment, instead of it being used and it gives good taste, it becomes tasteless. This is in verse 5. So they can't use the capper berries, uh, the small berry-like fruit of, of capper um, to make condiment and sauces with it. So he's observing the things that used to be naturally done, they're not natural anymore in verse 5. And at the end of verse 5 he says, for man goes to his eternal home, like mourners. So in conclusion, even man who used to walk and stand like trees, the time will come for them to die and go to their eternal home. Who in this generation at Pioneer Square Park is ready to go home? Which of us here is ready to go home? Which of us here is ready to meet our maker? Which of us is ready to quit our job and go home? The scripture says that you don't know the hour or the day. If the clouds became all of a sudden dark, and Christ appeared in the sky and said whatever the word that he was going to say and rapture some of us what would those of you who have big plans do would you be prepared for the rapture at this hour would you be prepared to go home with Christ and leave all of this behind would you be ready to leave your spouse whom you know is not saved to leave your brand new baby to leave your home you just purchased the job you just got would you be ready at this hour to go home you Christians and for those of you who aren't Christians would you be ready to meet your maker at this hour that's what Solomon is saying here in verse 5 are you prepared he says men are afraid of high places and of terrors on the road people are afraid to walk down the street children are afraid to go to school they carry guns women are afraid to get on buses and train they carry mace people are afraid to stand in the streets because somebody is about to smack them or hit them or kill them and so Solomon says this is you know and he uses these examples like the grasshopper drags himself when everybody knows that the grasshopper is an insect eating a uh, little animal that, that, that hops along, right? He's not hopping. Something's not right. He went down to observe that there is something not right here, right? And then what's even more not right is what? Man is going to die and leave this entire world behind, right? Says Solomon. And then he says at the end of the verse, Man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the streets. So people are going to be mourning for us when we die. In verse 6 he says, Remember him before the silver cord is broken. What is the silver cord is broken? The umbilical cord, the emotional tie between mother and child. Right? He says before the broken cord is crushed. When I think of gold, I think of how precious gold is to us, right? And terrible things, it would be a terrible thing for it to get crushed. You know, I looked through the scriptures to see if there was some sort of interpretation or hidden interpretation behind the whole concept of the golden ball being crushed. Or to take it literally, you know, a golden ball being squished. Now you see that and you would think, oh man, you know, we could have used that, 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 that bowl. When you go into the Old Testament, the utensils that the uh, Hebrews were asked to make by God, where they had golden spoons, um, the, the, the Hebrew high priest would use these things to, you know, to carry out the sacrifices and all of the rituals of atonement in, um, in the tabernacle. And we know that in history, that golden bowls and golden goblets and golden uh, uh, spoons and were stolen by Nebuchadnezzar um, 
you know, after Hezekiah the king had exposed the whole thing to, to the uh, Chaldeans. Uh, and God judged the Jews for practicing idolatry. So when I think of golden bowls, that's what comes to mind. So the scripture says here that uh, before the, the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, and the pitcher by the well is shattered. You've seen wooden pitchers or clay pitchers, right? If they fall into the ground, they will shatter because they're not very strong. It says here, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. We know that the cistern is a reservoir for, uh, for water, for holding water, for holding liquid. Right? That's what the cistern is. So he says, Remember God, before the silver cord is broken, before the golden bowl is crushed, remember God before the pitcher by the well is shattered. You know, an earthquake happens and the pitcher falls and cracks. Right? The wheel at the pitcher uh, cistern is crushed. What would crush the wheel? Maybe war, perhaps? Maybe war? So before these things occur, remember God. And in verse 7 he says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. This is the second time he's making reference to death in this passage of Scripture. Right? This is the second time he's making reference to death in this passage of Scripture. He says, then, that is at the time specified, right, dust, which is dirt of the earth, the body becomes dirt again, and the spirit and the soul returns to the Creator, right? Just as it's promised in Genesis 2.17, and just as it says in Genesis 3.19, right, when God had judged Adam in Genesis 3.19, the scripture says, Amen. Peace, brother. Amen. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. So the time will come and you know that's why we preach the gospel and say hey listen before the second coming of Christ now is the time to make the decision. Okay. Right now right this instant don't wait till you get home pray as you're walking by say father forgive me for my sin I repent. Father, grant me your Holy Spirit. I repent. Lord, I don't know when my time of death is. I give my soul to you in Jesus' name. You only need to say these words and mean it, and God will save you. You don't have to wait until the sin is done. You don't have to wait for me to call you. Make your uh, reconciliation with God now, not in an hour or next week or next year or when you grow old now is the time of your salvation and it's between you and God I'm not the Savior but the one listening in heaven is who sits at the right hand of the Father called Jesus verse 8 he says vanity of vanity says the preacher all is vanity it's all vain and it all ends in futility verse 9 through 10 I would summarize it by saying, Solomon the preacher, teacher, author of knowledge, truth, and proverbs. Solomon the preacher, teacher, author of knowledge, truth, and proverbs. Verse 9, not only did God give Solomon discernment, he made him a preacher, right? One who heralds, proclaims God's word. We see this in Romans 10, 14, 1 Timothy 2, 17, and 2 Peter 2, 5. He was also given the gift of teaching. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 28. He was given the, the gift of teaching to instruct the people in his generation to live righteously. 1 Timothy 1, 5. Right, to live righteously and to love. Solomon arranged and wrote Proverbs. Proverbs are, are, are adages, are bywords, short sayings. Solomon's example in life was David, his father, who wrote the Psalms, right? Hebrews 13, 7. He followed in the footstep of his father David to become a preacher, a teacher, an author who had knowledge, truth, and wisdom. Verse 10. The scripture says, The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. Des delightful words. Right? 
highly pleasing, How much is in it? affording Why great pleasure it? and satisfaction to the mind and heart or senses. Solomon was a wise teacher, one who was well informed, well instructed, very knowledgeable. He was mentally sound. We see in Psalms 119, verse 116, your words is truth. Solomon was a teacher of truth. Truth that is genuineness, honesty. 2 Timothy 2.15, right? Solomon was the word of truth. 2 Timothy 3.15, verse 17. Scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, training, correction, and righteousness. Solomon may have been writing things down that God spoke to him or dictated to him. We may not have all of his writings, but we have some of it, and that is enough for us to make a decision for Christ today. God used the writings of the prophets, the kings, to correct the lies of the devil. What writings of the scriptures are you reading for God to make the correction in your heart so that you could come to Christ today? If we're going to conclude verses, the point in verses 9 and 10, what Timothy was to Paul, so Solomon was to David his father, and Joshua was to Moses, men who came to know God and passed on their knowledge, that knowledge of God, of knowing God, his words of truth from man to man, thus like others before him, like Noah preached, taught, and wrote all that came from the mouth of God, all that came from the throne of God, from the Spirit of God in the Scriptures. We don't pay enough attention to what God is saying to us in this lifetime. What God has written is not just for the Jews, but it's for every man, every woman, every child in this generation. Verses 11 to 12. In summary, I would say the spoken written words of wise shepherds and warnings. Verse 11, he says, the words of wise men are like goats. The words of wise men are like goats. Give me one second. There'll be a second video.